вот. И вот. Михаил, good morning. Do you hear me? Good morning. Me? Oh, yes. We are ready. And we are really excited about it all. Likewise, I'm uh, really excited myself. And I'm a bit sad that I cannot be there with you guys. Um, unfortunately, the situation in the United States is not stable enough for, uh, for us to travel safely abroad. Um, okay, so can I take the floor virtually? Yeah, sure, you can start. Okay, let me just share the presentation with you guys. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Can you guys can you guys see the slides? Yes, we see it well. Great, amazing. So, uh, my name is Michał Koszynski. I'm a I'm an assistant professor of organizational behavior at Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm a computational psychologist, which means that I study humans through the lenses of computational methods and big data. And I'll be telling you today about my research on predicting psychological traits and specifically personality from digital footprints. But before I jump there, I should probably ask you guys, do we have any psychologists in the room? No psychologists, okay. Or maybe they're just shy and they're just hiding somewhere. Uh, okay, so as we have no psychologists in the room, let me then start with introducing you to um, uh, to the concept of personality uh, that we'll be uh, predicting from uh, digital footprints. Uh, well, personality is not a new concept by, um, by no means. It's quite old and it's also really simple and elegant. What basically personality theories, personality models propose is that human behavior is not random, but uh, it follows certain patterns. And this is a very simple idea, really. And to give you an example, if you are a friendly and social and outgoing person at work, you're also likely to be social, outgoing, and friendly in other situations, let's say at home with your family or with your friends. And you like to keep you know, your shoes parallel and everything clean, you're also likely to be well organized at work and you would um, make a great accountant, for instance, because that's uh, one of the jobs where being well organized is uh, very highly appreciated. Now, as you can see, it's absolutely not a revolutionary idea, but there are some interesting aspects to it. So first of all, personality research has shown that those patterns of behavior, they're not only stable across the situations, so we behave in a very similar way at work and then at home and then with friends while hanging out, but also the same personality traits are stable over time. So if you're a well-organized child, you're going to be, or you're very likely to be a very well-organized uh, adult. If you're a social and outgoing kid, you're likely to be social and outgoing adult as well. Now, again, it sounds pretty simple and intuitive, and uh, I bet that I haven't said, uh, said anything surprising yet, but then when you look deeper into those models, into theory of personality, what you will see is that it's pretty powerful, in fact. So let me give you just one example. If we all agree that a well-organized child is going to be, is likely to be a well-organized adult, and we know that well-organized adults, they excel at working as accountants, then what we can do, we can measure personality of a kid and be able to predict what kind of career this kid would excel at, right? It's pretty powerful of an idea. Well, it can save people from uh, bad educational choices and make our jobs nicer, uh, companies more efficient and economies um, um, uh, booming, right? So let me just come back to personality theories for a second. What you can see here on the screen is an illustration of four personality types that were proposed by Hippocrates over 2,000, 2,500 years ago. Hippocrates, the father of uh, modern medicine, uh, thought that there were four types of people, choleric, sanguine, 
melancholic and phlegmatic. Now, fast forward two and a half thousand years, and psychology, well, it didn't really move uh, forward so much. We now like to describe humans using five dimensions, which we call big five, a personality model, five factor, a personality model, or you can also uh, sometimes hear ocean as the name of this model, simply because ocean is an acronym formed by the first letters of the personality traits that are included in this model. And those personality traits are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Now, let us very slowly, or very quickly actually, because it's pretty intuitive, walk through uh, those five personality traits. Uh, personality dimension, personality trait of openness, basically distinguishes between people who are conservative and traditional on one hand, and open-minded, liberal, and artistic on the other hand. Uh, personality dimension of conscientiousness is a dimension that describes a difference between people who are uh, spontaneous uh, and not so well organized and those who are very conscientious, well organized, always on time and so on. Extroversion, introversion is probably one of the most uh, intuitive dimensions. Everyone knows what introvert and extroverts uh, uh, are. Uh, now, agreeableness is a dimension that describes the difference between people who are assertive, uh, don't like playing on a team, they um, um, are very self-confident and like to do uh, things alone, and also they're very self-confident, versus people who are agreeable, they're great team players, they uh, focus on basically agreeing, if, agreeing with everyone and trying to avoid conflict at all costs. And finally, the dimension of neuroticism distinguishes between people who are emotionally stable and uh, not so easily stressed, and people who are neurotic, emotional, uh, they tend to experience more negative uh, mood swings as well. Now, what you could see here are five dimensions, and each one of us, and each one of uh, 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 each one of uh, each person in the world could be described, get described by their scores on those five dimensions. And now, what? The research in personality psychology has shown is that those five numbers can basically very successfully subsume the huge variety of behaviors uh, that we can observe among human beings. So now knowing those five numbers uh, for a given person can help us to suggest a great career for them, help us to assign them to a right job or right task, uh, could help us to choose the right partner. Uh, for them, I recommend them books to read or movies to watch and so on. So basically, it's like a way of psychologists to get to know someone uh, very quickly, right? If you, if, if you interact with your personal friends, after some time, you would develop a very good intuition. You know, what are they like? What are the fears? What are the dreams? What their personality is? You may not call it personality, but basically that's what personality is. And this would help you to make your interactions with this friend of yours very smooth. Now, psychologists like to represent those differences between people as uh, those five dimensions. So now the big question is, if personality is so amazing and uh, has uh, so many, uh, let me skip this slide as we, uh, to save some time, but the question is if personality is so awesome and so amazing, why isn't it more widely used? And maybe I can, you know, maybe I can have someone from the audience try to guess. Why do you guys think that we don't use personality models more often in the real life? I think it's hard to decide uh, to which uh, personality actually one person uh, um, assigned. That's an, I don't know. that's an amazing guess. I, uh, I've seen some people in the audience raising their hands but I can also hear some people knowingly nodding their heads. And that's true. We basically are not using personality more widely because it's very difficult to measure, right? You either need to know someone really well or you need to take a personality questionnaire and personality questionnaires very often have hundreds of questions and they take 40 minutes or one hour or even some questionnaires take three hours to 
basically complete. And now it's basically difficult to expect that you would have a new customer coming to your business and you'd be like, excuse me, sir, you know, before I'm talking to you, you have to please fill this, uh, fill in this questionnaire uh, here so we can measure your personality, right? Very uh, impractical. Now, also questionnaires have quite a few downsides. They have quite a few problems to them. So first of all, people can very easily misrepresent themselves on a personality questionnaire. And this is specifically a problem when we could use, uh, when we could basically make the best use of personality questionnaire. Think about high stake situations such as recruitment or selection. When you're selecting a new employee, we know it very well. There's a lot of research showing that if you knew the real personality of this person, you could not only choose the right task for them, but you could also choose the task that will make them happy, which is great both for the company and for the employee in question. Now, unfortunately, when people take personality questionnaires uh, in high stakes situations like recruitment, what happens is they basically would just lie to uh, make themselves look more uh, desirable for the employer, um, which basically means that when we are using personality questionnaires in recruitment, we're selecting people who are willing to be most dishonest and best at misrepresenting themselves. Now, the other problem with personality questionnaires is that there are also what we call in psychometrics response biases, which is a very simple concept. It basically says that some people tend to agree with every question, for instance. Some other people tend to have a small tendency to disagree with questions. Some people like to present themselves in a more socially desirable way, you know, like the society would like to see them. Other people, uh, contrarians, like to present themselves as people who are maybe, you know, going against the mainstream. Now, those biases are very often unconscious. So even if you have a person that wants to honestly answer the questionnaire, they end up answering it uh, dishonestly in the end or inaccurately as well. And finally, and I already mentioned it before, questionnaires are very expensive, not only to administer, but also to take. Imagine if you have a typical recruitment situation when you would like to, uh, uh, when you hire for a big popular company, very often there will be thousands of people sending in their CVs. Now, what we're asking those people to do afterwards is to take personality questionnaire. And now if a personality questionnaire of this kind takes an hour, those are literally thousands of hours lost on filling in uh, those long questionnaires that could be spent on some more productive activities, uh, for instance, on work. So if personality questionnaires are, uh, well, first I need to say, if there are any users of questionnaires in the room, I don't have anything against questionnaires. It's probably the best thing that we have at the moment. But the question is whether we can do a bit better than that. And psychologists quite a long time ago said, hey, why would we even bother with questionnaires? Why would we ask people, hey, are you outgoing or where organized or are you friendly? Let's just look at their behavior and see uh, whether we can see those behaviors happening in the real world. And you can see a screen here. It's a screen from the movie, but the movie represents a real psychological study. There are quite a few of those where, where they would have a psychologist following a person around, you know, from the moment that they woke up to the mom to the time they went to bed, and basically would take a note of all of the behaviors and actions and things that the given person said. Um, an interesting approach to psychological measurement, but obviously, as you can see, also a bit creepy. You know, non, no one, I guess, or at least most of us, wouldn't like to have a psychologist following them. Uh, all day uh, round, but also obviously having someone on your tail all the time is definitely going to change your behavior as well. So the question is, can we actually observe a real behavior, a real person by following them around? So another idea that psychologists had was to, okay, say, okay, we shouldn't really be following people around. It doesn't work. It's very expensive and time consuming. So what we can do we can just go and look at uh, the spaces that people occupy 
and look for the footprints of the behavior, right? And the idea is really simple. If we have someone who is well organized, they will basically keep their bedroom, their office and other spaces in perfect order. And what you can see here, those are two pictures from a study from early 2000s where Samuel Gosling was basically asking people for a permission to look at their bedrooms and then was judging their psychological profiles based on what uh, he has found in those bedrooms. Uh, very interesting approach, pretty accurate as well. But again, the problem is, can we really walk around and look at uh, people's bedrooms? So now what happened in last 10, 15 years is that we got a new amazing environment where we can look at footprints of behavior, right? People have migrated in large numbers to digital platforms. Uh, they adopted digital devices such as smartphones and computers, and those devices are now mediating a large part of our uh, behaviors, social interactions, uh, information seeking, and even intimate relationships increasingly. And all of those behaviors and thoughts and, and uh, communications that we are using digital platforms for are now being recorded and stored. And um, back in 2012, which is quite a long time ago in the digital age, IBM estimated that an average person leaves behind 500 megabytes of digital footprints every single day. Now, if you multiply it by a number of people living in the world, this becomes a huge amount of data that basically we can analyze to try to figure out what psychological profiles these people have. Now a question to the audience. Imagine that we wanted to make a backup copy of all of the data that humanity is producing in one single day. Not one single human, but entire humanity. Now we would like to make a backup copy on paper so uh, it can last for longer. So we're printing it out on an A4 piece of paper, double-sided, font size 12, using zeros and ones to basically represent the digital content. Now, can anyone take a guess how tall would be a stack of paper containing just one day worth of data that humanity produced in 2012? Don't be shy, guys, and don't calculate it on your phones. I can see some people calculating the answer on their phones or looking at tin there. Even worse, or maybe better. So what's what's the answer, guys? No one knows. Okay, I will tell you then. Maybe it will be uh, <laughs> more than a uh, road to the sun and back. Wow, okay. Well, that's actually an amazing guess. I've never heard anyone estimating it as such a large number, actually, first of all. Uh, and second of all, I've never heard anyone being so close to the truth at the first try. In fact, the stack of paper would be from the Earth to the Sun four times over. Just one day worth of data that humanity is producing. So now let's think about it for a second. Having so much data, basically and data that was produced in the natural environment and the data that we can record retrospectively so we can look at a given human being and ask him or her for access to data that they've created over last 8, 10, 15 years really easily. Which basically means that it's virtually impossible to misrepresent uh, yourselves in this way. You can easily lie on a personality questionnaire that takes half an hour or an hour to complete, but it's very difficult to lie with your actual behavior over years uh, of time, right? If you can behave like a conscientious or extroverted person for eight years, you most likely an extroverted or conscientious uh, person full stop. Also, while the time of a psychologist is pretty expensive, the time of an algorithm, and you guys know, and you guys know it why, 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 way better than I do, the time of an algorithm is way cheaper than the time of a psychologist. And also this algorithm can be applied to thousands or millions of people simultaneously. So basically what it means is that we can conduct psychological assessment on very huge uh, numbers of people. 
So now let me move on and try to uh, tell you more about the digital footprints I'll be using in the studies that, uh, uh, that will be used in the studies that I will uh, share with you guys today. So there are plenty of types of digital footprints. There are uh, samples of text, such as tweets or emails. There are web browsing history, search logs. There are logs from your smartphones that contain not only your activities in the apps, um, but also your geographical location, the tone of your voice, and even the modern accelerometer in a modern smartphone can record uh, details, physiological details, such as, let's say, your heartbeat. So we are getting a lot of different types of digital footprints. Now, one of the most favorite digital footprints of mine are Facebook likes. Why? Because they're very pervasive. Everyone um, that I know, really, or most of the people that I know, uh, produce a large number of likes uh, every day while using Facebook. And also Facebook likes are pretty similar to many other types of digital footprints, right? If you like a given website, it's very similar to visiting this website and being able to record it through your web browsing logs. If you like a given artist or a given song, it's similar. It is similar to listening to this artist or this song uh, on service like Spotify or YouTube which basically means that whatever research we can conduct on Facebook likes, whatever results we can obtain on Facebook likes is likely, those results are likely to apply to other types of digital footprints as well. So one of the analyses we conducted uh, is to look at the relationship between Facebook likes and personality. What we did, we put personality questionnaires online. We created a website where people could take personality questionnaires, real personality questionnaires used in recruitment and selection, among other things. And people could get feedback on their scores, but they also could donate their uh, digital footprints, in this case, Facebook uh, profiles, uh, to our research project. So what we were able to do, we were able to connect a lot of personality scores from personality questionnaires with uh, people's Facebook likes. Uh, we collected more than 6 million uh, personality scores. People were very generous and very interested in participating. Uh, so the results I'll show you in a second are based on quite large samples. So let me start with the first dimension of, uh, of the Big Five model, uh, openness to experience. What you can see on the left are the Facebook likes that are most strongly associated with having low scores on openness, so basically being conservative and traditional. Uh, by the way, this research has been based on the US sample, so you basically see uh, mostly uh, US uh, Facebook uh, likes uh, over here. And you can see that people who are traditional and conservative, they uh, don't read, uh, they like NASCAR and ESPN. People who are liberal and open-minded, they like Oscar Wilde, Charles Bukowski, uh, uh, Plato, Leonard Cohen, and so on. So this simple exercise shows you that you can actually see very similar behaviors expressed in the digital environment that you would expect from people high or low on this trade of openness to express in the real life. So now let me remind you what personality traits there are because there's a quiz coming for you. So we have openness to experience, we have conscientiousness, extroversion, neuroticism, and agreeableness. And now the task for you guys is to guess what personality trait uh, what you are seeing here on this screen. Any guesses? I can't hear any guesses. Maybe yes, your microphone. Uh, we is have mute. no guesses, but we totally sure it's not openness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well done, guys. Well done. This was really smart. Okay, so you have four other trades left. What what trade is that? Neurotic, maybe. Neurotic. That's a good guess, but incorrect in this case. This is agreeableness. You see, on the left, you have disagreeable people. You know, they hate everyone. They hate police, and they hate you in particular. And then on the right, we have agreeable people who are compassionate and religious and uh, uh, they like praying and donating money and so on. Now, okay, so that was maybe a difficult one. 
Now you have only three personality traits left, and it's another quiz for you guys. What personality trait is that? On one side, you have manga and video games and role-playing games and Minecraft. And on the other side, you have cheerleading, sunbathing, theater, dancing, beer pong. What personality traits can you hear here? Extroversion. Great. Well done, guys. Okay. That was easy. Extroversion. Now, two personality traits left. Which one is that? People say it's neuroticism. And people are right. Uh, amazing. We have relaxed people who like extreme sports and they like earning money and uh, getting degrees in business administration. And we have people who are neurotic and emotional who uh, like vampires and they sometimes hate uh, themselves. Okay, and the last one, this one should be easy. Uh, we have, uh, on one hand, uh, um, uh, Wes Anderson, the famous director, uh, who, uh, who shoots very crazy and spontaneous movies. And on the other hand, we have law enforcement and uh, my calendar uh, and emergency medical services. So basically, um, uh, careers uh, that require uh, people to be very highly organized. Now, what I'm showing you here is uh, pretty intuitive and pretty simple of an example. And as you could see, even non-psychologists had little trouble guessing which traits uh, those likes represent. But now, what you need to realize is that those are only top 10 most characteristic likes or most characteristic digital footprints that represent each one of these traits. Now, in fact, when you look at an average person, they wouldn't like anything so revealing. So now the question is, given that most of our likes are way more revealing than that, can we still make, can we still create accurate psychological profiles based on uh, observing someone's digital footprints? And let me here show you a short video. Uh, maybe we'll skip the details on how to build the model because that uh, should be easy for you guys. And let me show, show you a short video representing it. And let me rewind it because you couldn't hear the beginning. Now, clicking like on Facebook is something most of us do without thinking. The University of Cambridge over in London actually did a study of what people like on Facebook to try to determine uh, facts about them that they wouldn't otherwise know. So they didn't just look at the products, the, the movies, the bands that people like. They also looked at the status updates that people liked, the photos that people liked. And they were able to draw some really, really interesting conclusions about all of your likes that you're clicking can tell more about you than you might have realized from your political values to your religion to your gender to your happiness to your age in fact some parts of your identity can be predicted with 95 percent accuracy accuracy was lowest about 60 percent when it came to predicting whether a user's parents were still together when they were 21 people whose parents divorced before they were 21 tended to like statements about relationships drug users were id'd with about 65 percent accuracy smokers with 73 percent and drinkers with 70 percent Sexual orientation was also easier to distinguish among men, 88% right there. For women, it was about 75%. Gender, by the way, race, religion, and political views were predicted with high accuracy as well. For instance, white versus black, 95%. The findings of alarmed privacy campaigners who fear this research could be used to commercially exploit users. So keep in mind that just because you think you're not revealing a lot of personal details on Facebook, you're still spreading the word to the outside world as well as those online marketers. Volunteers with few friends liked walking with your friend and randomly pushing them into someone or something. <laughs> It's not their fault they don't have friends. Everyone they know keeps getting randomly pushed into traffic. <laughs> High IQ corresponds to liking Mozart, science, and the Colbert Report. <laughs> Research indicated people who like Harley Davidson motorbikes are generally of low IQ. We thought we'd better offer a right to reply. I'd say our average customer is probably more intelligent than most, and we've certainly got a lot of customers who are, well, 
people from Cambridge University for a start. A like on Facebook can reveal if you're a gay man. Yeah, especially if what you choose to like is penises. <laughs> Walking yes. in, I'm like, oh! <laughs> it's a joke. Okay. By the way, don't be an idiot and think that if somebody clicked on Wicked the Musical that they're gay automatically, or they clicked on Harley Davidson and they're stupid automatically. Ironically, that would make you stupid. Okay, so uh, back to boring me. I'm sorry that Conan O'Brien cannot uh, be talking to you any longer. Uh, well, uh, so let me show you some results here that basically, uh, and let me walk you maybe a bit more slowly through the results. So what you can see here on this plot is basically the accuracy of the prediction models that we are built, we have built uh, in the study that, uh, that you heard the coverage uh, of. And what you can see here is that the more likes we can observe of a given person, the more accurately we can predict their traits, in this case, uh, personality. And this uh, is probably not a surprising uh, result to anyone. The more signal we have, the more accurate the model would be. Now, the question that people ask me when they see it, this graph is, okay, so beautiful lines, colorful and stuff, but please tell us, okay, so how accurate can the, real, the model really be? And to do that, we have conducted an additional study where what we did, we took uh, personality questionnaires and gave them to our participants' friends and family members. And now we had these friends and family members to fill in uh, these questionnaires in the name of our participants. So basically, let's say your wife would, or husband would take a personality questionnaire and try to answer it in your name, like, you, like she or he believes you would have answered it. So basically, she would use your, her knowledge of yourselves to fill in a questionnaire. Now, on the other hand, we would take your likes and we'll give it to an uh, artificial intelligence-based uh, predictor model uh, that uh, was also aimed at revealing your personality. And so we can do now, we can compare how accurate were your friends and family members versus uh, AI-based model. And what you can see here at this graph is that to achieve the accuracy of a work colleague at predicting your personality, you need to reveal to uh, the uh, AI model only 10 Facebook likes. Now, if you want to do better than the friend or cohabitant or a family member, you need around 100, 150 likes to reveal to the model. And finally, the most accurate of human judges can be beaten by a model that uh, has access to one uh, to 250, around 250 Facebook likes. And now, given that, uh, you know, it was some time ago, actually at that time, people on average had 230 likes, but people keep, keep liking uh, things all the time. So uh, what you will see is that with time, as we generate more and more digital footprints, AI models predicting psychological traits will get more and more accurate. And good news is that you guys can try uh, predicting your personality and other psychological traits used from your Facebook likes on your own. Uh, I encourage you to visit applymagicsauce.com website. Uh, this website is being hosted by Cambridge uh, University. And what you can do, you can share your Facebook likes and the models hosted on this, um, on this platform will try to predict your psychological traits and other uh, uh, traits, uh, demographic traits uh, as well. Okay, so, but Facebook likes is just one of the types of digital footprints and uh, I would argue that it's not the best one to uh, try to understand and psychologically profile people. Why? Because Facebook likes are to large extent a public uh, activity. We realize when we like stuff that other people would see what we are liking. Now. It turns out that uh, other types of digital footprints, like let's say websites visited, can reveal at least as much and usually more information about your psychological traits than Facebook likes. What you can see here on this, 
on this slide is a personality profile of an average person who visits a website called deviantart.com. Uh, very open-minded, very intro introverted, spontaneous, and uh, neurotic. Now, the same models can be trained on language. Uh, here, what you can see, those are two word clouds representing people scoring high and low on extroversion. You can see that extroverts talk about partying and love and weekend and everything is beautiful and amazing, whereas introverts, they talk about internet and computers um, 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 and uh, scientific uh, things uh, in general. And now finally, what's really exciting for me at the moment is that it, it seems that you can make very accurate predictions of someone's, of people's psychological and intimate traits based merely on the still images of their faces. So what you can see here on this uh, slide are top and bottom uh, uh, people, people who achieved top and bottom scores at a given personality scale. Uh, in fact, uh, well, uh, we just selected females here for this, uh, for this slide. So on one side, you have people on left on your, on your right side, I guess. You have people who scored very high on this dimension and on the other side, you have people who scored very low on this dimension. Now, there's no computer science magic here. It's just 10 images overlaid on top of each other. And I bet that you can guess what dimension that is. Any guesses? Extroverts. Extroverts, great. You have on one side, you have extroverted person. On the other side, you have introverted uh, people's pictures overlaid on top of each other. And let me now show you a slightly higher quality uh, uh, image. This is morph of uh, 100 top and 100 bottom um, uh, scorers on a given uh, on this dimension. You can see that extroverted women they do not only differ in terms of their expression. They are smiling. They are more likely to dye their hair blonde. There's more makeup uh, uh, visible also on most extroverted faces, whereas introverted faces they are less likely to smile, have darker hair. And uh, as you can maybe see there on the screen, they're also more likely to wear glasses. You have a shade uh, of the glasses on the introverted morph. Uh, on the extroverted morph, on the other hand, you could see that eyes tend to be blue. Now, we know that in Caucasian population, uh, blue eyes are not so popular uh, to actually show on a morph like that, which basically uh, suggests that extroverted women tend to replace glasses with contact lenses that uh, tend to be blue uh, or green. Now, uh, apart from grooming, differences in grooming and style, what you can also see when you look closer in these images is that there are also differences in facial morphology. So basically, introverts and extroverts would have slightly different shapes of facial features. Let's say uh, on this, this comparison here of introverted and extroverted women, would show you that introverted women tend to have slightly broader faces and shorter noses. Now, for a person, for a human being, this difference would be very difficult to spot and, and a signal of this kind would be very difficult to combine into an accurate prediction of someone's character. Now, it seems that computers tend to be really accurate at uh, making these judgments. You, uh, use, you would use deep learning networks uh, to basically, you would present your computer with your computer model with thousands or preferably tens or hundreds of thousands of images and then label those images with personality profiles. And what you will see that you can very easily train a model that will be very accurate at predicting personality. What you can see here are accuracies uh, when predicting big five personality models from human face. Now, before I will give back floor to you guys, and I hope you will have uh, some questions, I just wanted to discuss some implications of this finding. So first of all, obviously, there are huge privacy risks. We're talking today only about personality, or mostly about personality, but the very same models can be applied to predict your political views, your religious affiliation, your sexual orientation, and other very intimate traits that people otherwise would not like to share. Now, in the past, in order to learn such things about you, 
one would need to interview you or give you a survey or a question. And now you have a choice in such situation. You can either try to not answer a such survey or not answer the questions, or you could try to lie. Now, it became very difficult to lie in a situation in which the picture of your face or the list of your Facebook likes or your Spotify playlist can be turned by powerful AI algorithms into a very accurate prediction of your intimate traits such as personality, sexual orientation, political views, and so on. For me as a researcher, it's really exciting. Uh, on the other hand, well, on the upside, what's really exciting is that AI allows us also to look beyond what's visible with a naked eye. So basically, AI can help us spot patterns that would be difficult to spot otherwise using traditional methods, and in this way, learn more about humans and our behavior. Also, when we just look at personality and other psychological traits, AI gives us a chance to basically make psychological assessment cheaper, faster, and more accurate, which has tremendous consequences for many different industries. Think about uh, recruitment, where we can now search for candidates and look at their psychological profile, hopefully with their consent and in an ethical manner, at the unprecedented scale, which could basically greatly improve the match between people and their jobs, which would drive not only efficiency of the economies, but also happiness of the individuals. Now on the marketing side, you can think about adjusting not only marketing uh, choice of products that you're offering to people, but also adjusting the message, uh, that, so basically tailoring the message to the personality uh, of your audience, and in this way, try to make messages more relevant and interesting to people. Uh, and let me stop here and uh, see if you guys uh, have any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, hi, thanks for, uh, yeah, uh, thanks uh, for the presentation. I have uh, two questions. Um, yeah, hello. Hi. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, yeah, thanks for presentation. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one uh, is, um, is your um, uh, algorithm is available for the, uh, some kind of requirement, uh, for um, requirement uh, software? And uh, the second one is, um, I have read an article about the uh, Trump election and uh, about some software which helped in this, ele in this election. And uh, I would uh, like to know if uh, that, that is true or not. Well, so uh, first question, thanks for excellent questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, so the first question was about, uh, was was uh, your first question was whether my algorithms are available um well i'm a scientist working at the university so i do not really produce any commercial products i write scientific papers about what's possible now those papers are publicly available everyone can see or read papers uh, in the scientific journals and now obviously companies would companies and institutions would use uh, this knowledge, hopefully, I hope they will use this knowledge to build good algorithms, helping them to uh, make predictions about human character and traits in an ethical fashion. Now, one of my other missions is basically to warn the general public and warn uh, the policymakers about the potential downsides of such algorithms being used. And one of the potential downsides is that now you can try to profile people without their knowledge and behind their backs, and then use this psychological profile that you have obtained to maybe try to influence them uh, to um, some negative, uh, to do some negative things. Now, I think that uh, which leads me to my second, to, to your second question, which was about uh, whether Trump and other political candidates used this kind of marketing, targeting, or political uh, 
targeting in their campaigns? And the answer is, of course they did. Uh, in fact, the pioneers of political marketing, the pioneer, the biggest pioneer of political marketing uh, on a personalist level was Barack Obama, who was one of the first major politicians to use those technologies on a large scale. So basically what we have to accept now is that a fact, it's a fact of life that both marketers and political marketers will be using such technologies, will be building our psychological profiles and then adjusting their messages to, um, um, to become better at convincing us to their points of view or to buy their products. Now, let me just continue on that very quickly um, because obviously people find, find it a bit um, um, uncomfortable that they are being targeted in this way. But I want to stress that in great majority of cases, this is actually a very beneficial thing for not only for individuals, but also for democracies. And the best example would be, well, maybe not the best example, but a good example where everyone would agree that personalization is great is, let's say, your Spotify playlist or your Facebook newsfeed. People love the fact that those experiences are highly personalized and they're getting information that is relevant for them. Now, the same relates to political uh, to the targeting of political messages. If a politician can take a, polit a message and target it at you, make it relevant and interesting, uh, it's great for both the politician because they can uh, make you interested, but also it's great for the democracy because it makes people more interested, it makes messages more relevant and interesting to them and drags them into political process. Now, having said that, you can obviously use it in a negative way, let's say, as we can see, as we could see in last election, to try to discourage people from voting, which is an outrageous and very anti-democratic uh, thing to do. Okay. Um, hello. <coughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, I have actually I have two questions: a technical question and a personal question. So I'll start with the technical one. Um, how do you? How do you make the correspondence between the liked items on Facebook and the entities that you have shown? Like, what does it exactly mean that a person has liked Oscar Wilde? What, 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 what did he like, actually? Well, that's a great question. And from the point of view of AI, interestingly, it very often doesn't matter uh, what the given Facebook like represents. So for us human beings, we kind of... Are, we try to interpret you know, the behaviors of people or what people tell us. What AI would do, AI would com 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 compare your patterns of Facebook likes, whatever you're liking, with patterns of other people uh, that uh, are being stored okay. in the database. And then basically the reasoning of AI is pretty simple actually. If you like things that are similar to the things that you know an extrovert would like, it means that you are likely to be an extrovert. No, but, but, but you showed specific entities that uh, a person with a certain type would like. Like uh, someone with high, I don't remember which trait, would like Oscar Wilde and Mozart and uh, Barack Obama. What does that mean? What, what do well, the, what the, te the technical point here. Uh, what, oh, what, does it mean to, what does it mean to like Oscar Wilde? <laughs> what, what, kind of a page, what kind of pages did he like, actually? Oh, there is a basically a page on Facebook. Uh, yeah. called Oscar Wilde. It has ah. a specific ID <laughs> on Facebook and it's just that person click liked. Click, ah, okay, so this is like one, on one specific page. page right? Correct. Okay, sir. Okay, so okay. The, now the personal question. Um, I, I'm ashamed to admit that I do spend quite a lot of time on Facebook, but I actually like very few pages on, face, on Facebook and uh, I think I produce less than one like per day and these are only likes for user-generated content of people that I personally know. What does that say about my personality? Uh, well, it means that you're not very productive of a Facebook user. I'm, um, uh, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg wouldn't be very proud of you. Uh, well, uh, it's, it, you, it, I would have difficulty as a researcher external to Facebook, I would have difficulty to perhaps predict your, use my algorithm to predict your psychological traits, simply because most likely the things you're liking are pretty rare. Only few other people have liked them. Now, please know that if you're Facebook, 
this limitation doesn't apply to you, right? They still would get enough data to create a very accurate profile of your behavior. And actually, I would argue that there's an evidence that they uh, that they got your profile right, which is you said you spend a lot of time on Facebook every day. Now, if you spend a lot of time, it means that you're probably enjoying your Facebook experience. But why are you enjoying it? Well, because AI running Facebook newsfeed was able to choose the news stories and other content that basically was matching your psychological profile really well. And just to make one more... I, I hate the news stories on Facebook. Well, why do you spend I, I, so much time well, every day I, I, I watching like, it then? I, I like the user-generated content. I like the things I that see. my friends do. Okay. Okay, that's actually two amazing points here. So first of all, Facebook likes are by no means the best way of making our psychological profiles, revealing our psychological profiles. Think about credit card records or web browsing. Those are those are footprints that we increasingly have no choice but to leave. You, you cannot function without the credit card in many countries. You cannot function without uh, browsing the internet. So there are many other ways in which to um, reveal uh, your profile. And another interesting thing that you mentioned is that you said you like user generated content or user shared. Maybe some people, I personally like content that is shared by my friends. Now, the thing that we all have to realize is that the fact that you see a content generated by your friend or content shared by, well, con content shared by your friend on, on your newsfeed is not just the effect of a friend creating it or sharing it. It's also an effect of AI deciding that you will enjoy uh, this kind of content. And also it's an effect of companies paying Facebook to show you given type of content. So when you see a story from New York Times shared by your friend, the fact that you see this story is, story is driven by two things, that your friend shared it, but also by the fact that New York Times paid Facebook to show you this story. And this is kind of a crypto marketing, marketing that people don't realize is happening there. Uh, and I think we should be more aware of that and develop some you know, immunity uh, to just trusting everything that we can see on Facebook. Hi, Michal. Thanks a lot Hi. for the presentation. I have a very, uh, I have a question about some of the not obvious features that you mentioned, like uh, the shape or the length of the nose, was it, <laughs> on the on the image? So, if you said, for example, that mimicry or some wrinkles on the person's face can influence um, the their personality, like extra uh, extra probably have more wrinkles because they smile more or something like that. That would sound credible to me. But when you say, you're saying about something about the shape of the nose, uh, it sounds like um, a coincidental correlation. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, in statistics, you can take two unrelated things and you can find correlation between them if you really want to. So <laughs> I, I was wondering, if the, is there a possibility that this is just coincidental? Uh, well, if you have sample, that's a great question. And that's... But I don't agree with you that you can find correlation between two things if you just want to. We can, we can see and find plenty of correlations in big data sets. And we often do not really understand why the correlation is there. You know, just the fact that two things are correlated does not mean that there's a direct relationship between them. But if you have enough data, and in our case, we work with literally millions of faces, and you can see reliably that extroverts have longer noses among females, then I'm not saying that your longer nose makes you extroverted or being extroverted makes your nose longer. I don't say that. I don't say that. But there might be an underlying common cause that makes your nose longer and makes you extroverted. And I'm sure you heard a story of Pinocchio. Uh, that's one explanation, possible explanation. Another possible explanation, in fact, is that Please note that the same, that when your brain develops at the prenatal stage, so basically when you're in your mother's womb and your brain develops and your face develops at the same time. Now, the development of your face and your brain are both driven by hormones. And we actually understand it already pretty well. We'll just say no, we know that testosterone, uh, that high levels of testosterone when you develop in the mother's womb would make your face broader. And also those high, high level of testosterone during development of your brain will lead to slightly different 
talents and potential that your brain would have. So let's say people who got higher testosterone brains that basically were developed with higher levels of testosterone, they tend to be less skilled socially, but more skilled in mathematically and in terms of mental rotations and uh, 3D objects and whatnot, right? It doesn't make those brains better or worse. It just, those hormones affect both faces, development of the face and development uh, of the brain. Okay, I see. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Hi. Thanks for the lecture. Um, so as I, if I understood you correctly, what are you doing is you are embedding a user like human space into five-dimensional number space uh, in a, some kind of supervised way. Can we say that? That's yeah, a correct yeah. Uh, yeah. interpretation, I think. Yeah, good. So, uh, so we're all afraid that uh, someone is going to use this information to optimize uh, some measurable goals, like, uh, I don't know, number of votes, for example. And, uh, but we can go another way. We can, uh, in an unsupervised way, embed humans into n dimensional vector space. So have you considered the comparing these uh, two ways, actually? Thanks. Well, uh, that's a great point. And in fact, going forward, who cares about Big Five? You can embed people in n-dimensional spaces. And this, because you have more dimensions, you can describe humans in more robust ways. Now, being able to describe humans in more robust ways means that we can predict their behavior uh, and reveal psychological intimate traits in a way more accurate way. So Big Five is a useful method of trying to connect human brain with artificial brain, right? So let's say when Facebook AI optimizes marketing targeting and chooses adverts for people, and now it does it based on thousands of behavioral dimensions that describe every single Facebook user in, well, the brain of a Facebook AI. Now, the problem with these dimensions is that, well, they are great at predicting your future behavior, but they are not interpretable for human beings. So now being able to translate those behavioral dimensions into lower, uh, into smaller space of five dimensions that we can all understand, like personality, or maybe also gender, age, maybe intelligence, maybe political views. So those simple concepts that our simple AIs, well, biological eyes, uh, intelligences in our heads can basically comprehend and understand, this is a very useful exercise. I will give you an example. If you have a new product, or if you have a politician, and you want to promote this politician or the message of this politician on Facebook or in other environments, now, the problem is that, first of all, you don't yet know AI, sorry, AI doesn't yet know who's going to click, who is going to like. Moreover, in terms of politicians, there is a very slow feedback loop. If I'm selling soap or movies or whatnot on Facebook, you know, I put it on Facebook, people click, so AI can very quickly learn that, you know, given product is attractive to given people and build a connection. Now, if you promote political messages, the feedback loop is really long. You know, people will only go voting in, you know, months. Now, being able then to translate those complicated, well, those multidimensional end space, end dimensional spaces to basically a language that human can understand can help a marketer or PR manager to design the message and design the, uh, and choose the targeting group uh, uh, that will work in a situation where computer AI has trouble learning. Yeah, great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for a great question. The last one. Uh, Michael, thanks for the wonderful uh, speech. Uh, my question is the following. If I understood correctly, you referred in a positive manner uh, of personalized content, right? But uh, don't you see uh, there might be a risk of getting too personalized, too biased? I mean, uh, let's say a person liked Oscar Wilde and he gets offered Oscar Wilde. Uh, the person never knows about existence of Dostoevsky. Just, just because, like the new, the news film, uh, the news feed just starts getting around his existing likes, and and like information he's starting to get from the world is unbiased, is far from real. Or to put it to a simple extreme, if a person liked an apple, he gets offered an apple, he would never learn about uh, existence of oranges. Like there's a risk of missing something important just because you didn't like it like ten years ago. Uh, that's a great that's a great point and a great question. And in fact. I think it's not only, well, 
plenty of people actually worry about it, including me. Now, what we actually see in the real world is quite the opposite, that high personalization of the content is actually expanding people's, widening people's horizons. Let me give you one very simple example, uh, Spotify. So people in the past, you know, when you went to, you know, US, when you went to Poland in the past, there were like three bands and everyone was listening to those three bands. Why? Because there was broadcasting, there were three radio stations. It was very difficult even to choose a, a different piece of content. Now, just between 2015 and 2016, the number of unique composers or unique artists that a person is listening to on Spotify increased by 20%. So what we're actually seeing, we're seeing this proliferation, this, this huge boost in the variety of content that people consume. The same happened with news. You know, in the past, you know, I bet when you guys were... Uh, you know, it was the situation in Poland, certainly. There were three or four major newspapers, and, you know, people were just buying those three or four major newspapers. Their the kind of horizons were just limited to what the given newspaper was offering them. Now, today, an average person in any given day, or well, uh, would see tens of different stories from many different outlets, which uh, arguably increases the variety of information that we are getting and not decreases it. Thank you. I can't hear anything. Thank you very much indeed. Um, a technical question. If uh, my uh, target group are the women uh, who live in uh, in uh, my city and uh, they are pregnant or uh, having uh, little babies. How to correctly reach access to the data from Facebook uh, touching uh, such uh, a target group? Thanks so much. Well, so in fact, Facebook advertising platform allows you to target people based on a very broad number of psychodemographic dimensions. You can target people based on their geography. You can target people based on the life situation. So you can, um, you can in fact select people who are married or in the relationship. You can select the length of the relationship, uh, age of the target group, gender of the target group. Uh, not all of the possible behaviors or demographic traits are in, well, not all of the demographic traits are included in a marketing platform. I'm not sure, actually. I don't. Rem I don't think that there is a, a expecting uh, being an expectant matter category. But what happens is that you can also target people based on their based on their Facebook likes. And now you could create a model, and this model could be intuitive, or this model could be data driven, which basically links liking certain things with a chance of having a baby. Now, obviously, the a very different question is. Is it okay to target people based on, uh, you know, them being expecting a baby? And when I say okay, it's both an ethical question, but it's also a question of whether it will serve your business because you may end up creeping out your customers, and they'll be like, oh my god, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm a bit afraid that those guys know too much or are too nosy. Okay, but my question is, how to reach the data set uh, touching such a um, uh, target group? Well, how reach, reach the data um, about their likes? I wouldn't know how to do it in Ukraine because basically I don't know the local uh, technological scene uh, well enough. But let's say in the United States, there are quite a few examples of, there are actually quite a few companies that did that. So let me give you one perhaps most well known example of Target. Target is a big uh, uh, store, like a. Uh, or kind of a store uh, that sells, uh, um, they basically had those large stores that you have in the suburbs. So what they did, they had loyalty cards and credit cards so they could, they could track people buying stuff. And also what happens in the US that the birth records are public in some states. So if there is a new kid being born, this would basically leave, an of, they would leave a trace in an official uh, records in a given county. 
Now, what scientists, what data scientists at Target did, they collected this data, collected data about kids that were born, and looked up the parents in their database so they could find the things that the parents were buying, and they trained the model that was predicting that you will have a baby from the patterns able to predict whether you have a baby, we're going to have a baby or not, very often before expectant mother even realized that she's pregnant because her buying patterns would already change, but maybe her craving for chocolate or for something else increased, uh, but she wasn't even yet aware that she actually was expecting a baby. Now, you could imagine similar approaches in different contexts, but obviously the big question is uh, whether this is not going too far. Uh, whether customizing your marketing or other messaging in this way would not make people feel uncomfortable. And having your customers feel uncomfortable, it's not only unethical, but it also might be counterproductive to your marketing efforts. And instead, in fact, Target got severely punished by public outrage. There was basically a huge explosion of articles and Target got, a, got, a, got hit. Their sales got hit by, uh, uh, by conducting those predictions. Thank you. Hi, thank you a lot for this lecture. We are really excited uh, and uh, wish you successful in your researches, uh, etc. And uh, we would like to see you in person, maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> I would love so to do that. And I'm really sorry, guys, that I couldn't join you. And, you know, in fact, the reason is that it's basically it's difficult to travel when you live in the US. I'm not I'm not a citizen. And what happens is that if I leave you, to come back. Um, so I hope that this situation will be uh, will be solved on my side as well. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, guys.